There is very little, but luckily there is one um, extremely important record, um, which is uh, was in the book published by Hans Sloan, who was actually uh, originally from a Northern Ireland family, kind of a colonial family, if you will, um, and then ended up participating in, in British colonialism in, in Jamaica as well. Um, uh, ended up a very important person because he he's actually, his collection created the British Museum. Um, he ended up a very important figure in England. Um, so Hans Sloan spent uh, a few years in the 1680s in Jamaica. He was the physician of the governor who died soon after he arrived. So I guess he wasn't a very good physician, but he became a kind of natural historian. Um, he was interested in understanding the plants and fauna of Jamaica and quickly came to realize that the people who knew about that were essentially some indigenous people, maroon communities and the enslaved. They were the ones who had the most intimate knowledge of, of what plants were there and what medicinal plants were there. So he then became interested in the kind of culture of the enslaved. And he brought back, in fact, some musical instruments that unfortunately have been lost now, but were for a while in his collection. And we have images of those. Luckily, uh, Sloan published in 1707 in his book, Voyage to the Islands, which de described this travel, which is mostly about the natural history of the islands. He did publish one single page of music, of actual musical notation. Um, and on that page, again, from Jamaica, we have basically five pieces of music, one called Angola, one called Papa, and, one, and then three under the rubric Coromanti, um, that he describes as having been played at a festival where, where black musicians came together, enslaved musicians, we can, we can assume. Um, the pieces were written down by someone he names as Mr. Baptiste, who we believe um, probably was a person of African descent, maybe from one of the other islands, someone who clearly had musical training um, and the ability to write down the songs. So these pieces are extremely valuable because they allow us to listen um, to, the, to certain, essentially probably little bits of much longer improvisations or music. And what is interesting about that page is that even though it's just one page, you have extremely different styles of music represented from different parts of the continent. Um, so it's sort of uh, exemplifies the fact that you had these, you know, at one gathering, you might have people playing different styles and then hearing one another and relating uh, relating those styles. A as early as the 1680s, this process was going on. So that's a very valuable and important um, piece. It then takes really until the, the 18th century um, and the 19th century to find other cases of people uh, with transcriptions of music, you know, with notation. There were lots of travelers who would sort of say things about music. Um, but this this material from the 1680s is actually our earliest uh, notation that that we know of. Um, there may well be others that that will emerge, um, but of of music in the Caribbean specifically, and in many ways very important musical notation just in African music too, because there isn't a lot of you know for the seventh for, it's it's music that is being played by people from Africa in Jamaica in the 17th century. So it does tell us also about something about that music in in the African continent. In Hans Sloane's book, there's an image of a few instruments from the Caribbean that are essentially lute-like instruments. It's kind of the earliest images we have. They, they look like kind of banjos. They've got a gourd with a, a drum, uh, you know, a skin on them. So kind of drum, gourd with a neck. Um, so we, we know that those instruments were collected in the 17th century in Jamaica and existed there. There's other accounts also of sort of various like balafon and uh, marimba style instruments. Uh, by the 18th century, we have much more engravings that show a wide variety of instruments, including also, um, you know, what are known as imbira in Central Africa, sometimes called like thumb pianos, those the instruments with small metal. Um, so, and there seems to have been lots of different instruments that people were basically making from scratch. I mean, um, they were making in their own case. But at the same time, a lot of enslaved people began also playing European instruments. Um, and in fact, significant numbers of there was a reasonable number of enslaved people who became trained in European musical traditions in the, in the theaters in, in Saint-Domingue and French Saint-Domingue, which became Haiti. Um, many of the orchestra members were actually slaves who, who were enslaved people who were there as, you know, played in the orchestra. So you do have, um, and when you look at, by the 18th century, certainly when you look at the, the sort of advertisements for, for enslaved people who ran away, um, many of them describe them as musicians um, and most often playing the violin in some way. So, you, so partly because that was a skill that if you, if you were seeking to escape going to an urban area, you could use that as a, as a you know, livelihood, obviously. Um, in a few cases, we find also banjos being mentioned. But um, it does seem that the, the, in particular, the violin 
uh, became a very important instrument from the European side uh, in the Caribbean and, and was frequently described alongside instruments that were being made, drums and, and other forms of lutes. Um, the interesting thing is that to build those instruments, people were in a different context than they were in Africa. So they were using different materials. And one very significant shift that is important in the history of the banjo is that while most of the lutes in Africa had um, circular necks, essentially like a stick as the neck with strings on that, or else harp forms, um, harp with a kind of stick and, and the things strung together, There's, there weren't really flat necks. Whereas in already in the 17th century Caribbean, you see a structure that has the, the basic uh, resonator that the African instruments have, which is a, you know, a gourd or wooden with a drum skin on it, but then a flat neck, um, which is interesting. And I, you know, there's lots of questions about how that emerged. Partly, of course, many enslaved people were carpenters building things on plantations. They would have ac had access to the tools to make that kind of stuff. And also, of course, the perhaps the, the, the influence of the guitar or, or forms of instruments that had those flat necks. So you do get sort of, um, you know, I think musical instruments and musicians are always, they're always experimenting and kind of doing these things. I'd say that the most important thing that's carried in terms of instrumentation is these these stringed instruments that have a drum skin on them, which did exist at times in Europe in like the Iberian period in the 15th, 16th century. But by the period of the, of the slave trade, you, that's not very present at all in European instrumentation. And it's present almost everywhere in African interpretation. So I would argue that that was a common thing that, that people of African descent in the Americas kind of associated with because it's a sound that is also a form of resonance. You know, it's, it's kind of like a, the drum head hums as people who hear the banjo know. So it's not just the melody, but you're having a kind of that, that sonic effect um, would have been very familiar to, to people who had heard music in pretty much anywhere in Africa. And I think it's very significant that that has been maintained in the banjo, particularly all the way to the present day. Um, and that's one thing that even as other things shifted, people kind of held on to having, um, you know, not just a wooden resonator, but actually having an animal skin um, on, on that thing, even though it's very complicated <laughs> to hold animal skins. <laughs> I think so it's a, it's a technically very challenging thing, but it, that clearly created a sound that people felt was important. So you can really see that there was a, a, a trajectory of people maintaining um, maintaining certain forms of, of African sound that they were invested in, and then others discovering those sounds in the case of the banjo and, and coming to love them as well.